sahabat cecep, welcome back to our podcast channel. You are listening to Xiaomiao Cecep Podcast. My name is Fatima and I'll be the host for today's podcast. To celebrate our fourth anniversary, today's podcast is a bit special. We have a very special guest star. He is one of our advisory board members and he is from Dongnanda. Uh, maybe you can guess who is he? <laughs> He's been involving in various activities of Xiaomi Chechep. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he is an Associate Dean of International at the Faculty of Education and Social Work. And he is also Associate Professor at the University of Auckland. So, without further ado, please welcome Associate Professor Morek Tessar. Kia ora, Professor. How are you? Kia ora, Fatima. Thank you so much for this beautiful, warm welcome. Thank you. I, it is a pleasure for us to have you today, and it's also enough for me to be the host of today's podcast. So, Professor, I heard that you've been involved in many activities of Siamir Chechap. If I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken, it's since the very beginning of Siamir Chechap established. It's around 2017 or 16? 16. 16, so it's like been five right. years, Professor, that's a that's long right. time. That's right. So in 2016, um, I was leading the international team that led the study that actually established Simeo Chechep. And ever since then, I was part of the creating various roadmaps and uh, part of its advisory board, supporting development of Simeo Chechep, support its activities, uh, uh, reporting, and it's just my pure pleasure and privilege to be here celebrating fourth anniversary of this very important and uh, wonderful organization that's really looking at research and capacity building and training of of uh, of, of related stuff. So that's an um, Simio Chacha plays a very important national, regional, and international role, and uh, and I'm very delighted to be associated with it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, we received a lot of support from you. So thanks so much for your endless love and support for our centers, of course. I think we can um we can like we can reach until now with the long journey is because like a lot of partners like support us. And right. one of you uh, one of them is you. So thanks so much, Professor Marek. Oh, it's a pure pleasure. It's a pure <laughs> pleasure. And I have to say that uh Part of the, it's not only my support, it's also how I felt supported by all the members of Simeo Chechab and collaboratively working together. And I I used to, in the pre-pandemic times, pre-COVID times, I used to visit Indonesia very often. Why? And I did a lot of research projects and a lot of connections at uh, various universities and also Simeo Chechab. And I'm so much missing those connections and the beautiful people of Indonesia. And uh, I've learned every time I come to Indonesia, I've, I learned so much about both scholarship, but also about culture and importance of relationships. It's something that um, I really hope that uh, after the pandemic is over, that I will have a time to visit Simeo Chechab again. And of course, Simeo Chechab will be able to come here to Aotearoa, New Zealand to visit me here. So you're very welcome, Fatima, to come. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. So you are most welcome to come and visit us again soon yeah. if the condition is getting better. So I remember mm. I went to New Zealand like three years ago on my summer yes. vacations, and that was amazing experience. <laughs> did you, so did you enjoy it? it? Sorry? You enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because I went to like South Island, like we have a road trip with my friends on our, my summer vacations. So that's amazing. I really hope that I can go there again mm. and maybe please go. Please yeah go. maybe i can like visit auckland and meet you there <laughs> absolutely i can show you around <laughs> thanks so much so professor Murray, today we are going to have like a casual talk about the current issues related to yes. early childhood education especially yes. in this pandemic era um yeah we've been living side by side with the coronavirus for like almost two years yeah. and there are a lot of things that happen in this arsentine period Currently right. in Indonesia, due to the increasing numbers of cases, restrictions on right. community activities are being forced. Mm. So we are like, we have to study and work mm. at home. So mm. since we're talking about COVID-19, how is the latest condition in your country, in New Zealand? Mm. Mm. Thank you for your question. And uh, in order to answer it, I sort of have to, as you say, we've been living with the virus for, or we've been governed 
and uh, by the virus for for quite some time, almost 18 months. And um, it's been a uh, really difficult journey. And I want to always, when I think of this time, I think of uh, not only ourselves and uh, but for about all the teachers and children communities that are really affected by the conditions of virus. New Zealand, Outra New Zealand has been uh, has been very lucky in a lot of a lot of ways. Part of it is because Outra New Zealand is located quite far down, you know, remote island, quite far away, and um, that allows us to, from the very early stages, to impose very strict lockdown mm-hmm. and um, and uh, eliminate virus within the within on the island and kept the borders shut. So mm-hmm. in Outra New Zealand at the moment, there is no community transmission. There is um, no virus. So the life on an island currently is happening supposedly as if there would be no pandemic, supposedly. Mm-hmm. Yes, we, we still take various precautions. And uh, yes, there are a number of processes in place and we wear masks on public transport. But we're very lucky that we decided to take elimination pathway of the virus rather than trying to live with it in a community. We did that to protect the most vulnerable ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in the past 18 months, um, New Zealand has about 5 million inhabitants. We had, I think, 22 deaths. That was in the first wave. 22. 22, yeah, two, two. Okay. yeah. and um, and currently there and um, last every time there is uh, something that happens in the community, we impose a lockdown. So there are these kind of uh, flash lockdowns that sort of happens. But last one happened. Um, last one happened in Wellington, couple of um, couple of months ago for five days. Uh, but normally um, we we are very successful because. No one can come into the country without staying at the managed isolation and uh, very careful procedure. So, um, and that has really changed the way we're thinking about education, and it has changed also the way we interact. Because as a as Kiwis or as New Zealanders, we tend to travel everywhere, and because we're so far away, we are relying on people coming here and bringing their knowledge and their experiences and we sort of melting pot of cultures and nationalities and languages and uh, and now sort of everything has stopped. So uh, so that's that would be that part of it that response and that um, impact of the pandemic that you sort of were asking about is also related to the idea that our government has very clearly indicated that. Uh, we need to be kind to each other. And this is the time to be supportive and kind to each other, look after each other and be part of the community, unite together against COVID-19. I also argued in a number of um, academic papers that I published on COVID-19 that the idea is that part of why we are sort of so successful here is that we, a lot of countries are talking about the social distancing and need to have social distancing. I sort of translated it that it's not a social distancing. We should be socially close to each other as much yeah. as we can. Yeah. But we need to have physical distancing. So I think that understanding these kind of uh, nuances that we are not to avoid each other. We are not to hide from each other. We need to maintain for the well-being and mental health, our relationships, and trying to keep together in these difficult times is the key. And um, and of course, the, there are all of this sort of if some and, and, and I think that the part of why New Zealand is so successful in this is that the government has set the tone right. Mm-hmm. And that has sort of trickled down and translated into number of policies and, and people, people believed and understood that this is very important. So we we because we acted, our prime minister always used to say, hard and early, you know, not to hesitate, you know, not to think about it for one week, but rather to make a very strong statement and impose something, even if it means that 
economy is going to suffer for a couple of days. Right. We decided that the human life is the highest value and is the most important, despite that some of these actions may lead to uh, loss of uh, some yeah. economic loss. profits. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree more with you, Professor. I think like, the mm-hmm. government, the community, we as a community is like, really have to like not social distancing, but also like we have coming together to like facing this difficult time. I couldn't agree more that government having a very important role in a, like a state what is we have to, what we have to do uh, in right. this pandemic era. Right. So talking about this uh, in the academic situations, um, right. of course, there are maybe are there any significant changes in children's pedagogical aspect in New Zealand due yeah. to pandemic situations? Maybe you can share. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's a very good question. And I think that um, I need to come, I, I, I sort of uh, think that this is a really important point because I think we need to come back to the beginning of pandemic because then we can trace the roots of what actually is happening right now. Because when the pandemic started, like many countries around the world, so, some didn't, but many countries sort of got really scared because it was unknown we didn't know what it is and what right. was happening and a lot of countries imposed the lockdown in various shapes and forms and closed schools and early childhood centers so um all early childhood centers were closed for um i think in new zealand initial period of six weeks i think it was mm-hmm. and uh then it opened for um some type of um, workers but it wasn't up to i think eight or nine weeks till till uh, children of uh, of um, of children f- coming from families where there are no uh, um, where, where there are no uh, medical or other sort of important workers could be able to return back to childcare. And my point being that everything has changed at that point because children, young children. I have a child, for example. Children. I have two children, but one of them was in a childcare at the time. He has not spent such a sustained time with parents mm-hmm. in one flat for such a long time. There was something fundamentally that has changed in the relationship. And when the childcare reopened, and we took our child back to childcare, and I talked, and then I did the research around this and talked with a number of different childcare and kindergartens. It was literally like a starting transition again. It was, there was something fundamental different. When children come back after holidays or, you know, when there is a break, you know, and different countries are different breaks, obviously, but, yeah. you know, even after summer break, it's different than coming after such a prolonged period of time when you spend with both of your parents or with the adults that you live in the house or back to, childcare, it was transitioning them back to the childcare and understanding the routines, the roles, what it means. I still recall taking my boy to childcare. It was literally, there were seven children crying at the same time as they were being dropped off. And um, it's been, um, and that would never happen Mm pre-pandemic. So it was, so suddenly... So what what we learned was that something has changed and the children very quickly picked up on a narrative that's been happening. Children, I I said, I, I wrote a paper that sort of argued that during the pandemic time, it wasn't young children that suffered. They had a great time with their parents. Some of them never been happier to spend time finally with their dad. Normally their dad would be at work all the time and would barely sort of see him. Now suddenly they had him as his disposal. It was parents that were really struggling in juggling the childcare and, and children's education and uh, and uh, schooling and their own work, you know, setting up oh. their home office and trying to do right. all the work. So, so I think that the children were not bad. When children started to return back to schools and to childcare, that's where that transition Mm-hmm. That's when children were really struggling. And that's where pedago- that's where new sort of, I would call a new pedagogy had to be established in order to retransition children back 
into settings. And I think this was very difficult for the teaching teams to think about it, how to sort of um, deal with this. Because suddenly, um, when you work in a childcare or when you work in kindergarten or in school, uh, usually transitioning, at least in New Zealand, children at particular times. But here suddenly, it was like when you open the school for the first time and you need to transition everyone. Yeah. And um, it was difficult enough that you had to bring in uh, separate measures. That means that under different levels of, uh, of alert, you had to have particular distancing and particular hygiene in place. Yeah, or the health things. protocol, right. Yeah, yeah. But in addition to that, you had this massive transition. Part of it also was that the, um, I think teachers, they, they understood that this is also their opportunity to become a leaders in particular way and developing new skill sets. I, for example, was especially interested when I did the research last year uh, with two of my colleagues um, on what happened with the teachers of infants and toddlers in child cares and how they dealt with it. So we did this fantastic research with number of kindergartens where they were showing us how not only what went wrong during pandemic, mm -hmm. but what they pointed out to us. And that's what I want to say because this I think is very important. But what kind of opportunities that brought for the teachers? Because I think it's very important that we look at this time. I mean I think it was Winston Churchill who said that never let a good crisis go to waste. So it means that, you know, you, you can always make something interesting, something could, some change or something. And I think the teaching teams took liberty, especially mm -hmm. here in New Zealand, to understand that a lot of things that we were doing actually potentially doesn't make sense and are not that important. Mm -hmm. But these things are really important and we need to pay more attention to these things. So it helped to speed up and translate some of these um um, processes that were not uh, that normally would take years and years of discussions and debates and pandemic helped to speed it up I, mean, I guess similarly when you think of um, higher education or elsewhere you know in the, in the old days you couldn't imagine you would have a zoom call or something yeah, to right. set up a meeting you would have to come in person mm -hmm. now sort of it's more acceptable it doesn't replace the face-to-face -face meeting but it provides an opportunity in the times when you can't, because of machete, right, in Bandung, to get yeah. from one side <laughs> to the other, you, you, you can just zoom, right? So right. Uh, so that's an, um, so similar opportunities in childcare to really think about. The teachers set up a Zoom calls. The teachers set up various songs and things to provide for families during the time of lockdown. Extreme innovation and right. extreme what I would call heart and care for those children and families. And I think that that's what happened in every childcare because that message came all the way from a government that be kind, be supportive. These yeah. are difficult times. We need all together. Hmm. Right. I think what you what you said before is very important. Uh, I like how you um, perceive that there is a new pedagogical approach yeah. and also the transition yeah. uh, in this pandemic era mm -hmm. and for mm -hmm. teachers there's a lot of opportunities for them yes. to like improve their new skill set uh, skill, mm -hmm. skill set of course mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. talking about the teaching innovations and opportunity Adam, mm -hmm. uh, how do the students and also the, the parents perceive the teaching innovations implemented in the yeah in the center right well that's a very good question i think that as, as i'm as i said that uh New Zealand is a little bit very specific example. And I have to say that New Zealand always been a specific example of both pedagogical and curriculum innovation. So we, unlike in many other countries where there's been a really long time when children were not coming to mm. schools and to child cares, we understood that we need to get children back to school and to child care as soon as possible because they need to have that experience, but also those poor parents. You know, it's very hard on a well-being and, yeah. and mental health of everyone to be to basically doing two, three jobs at the same time, you know. And I I became extremely worried how much felt on uh 
on on women and on on mothers and on carers you know of uh, of running the household uh, educating the children and doing the job at the same time and i think it's been extremely difficult and uh, so i think the the centers because early child centers and child care most of the teachers unfortunately i have to say are women you know and men teachers are still more um and not so common, maybe two or three percent of the overall right. teaching workforce. That also happened in Indonesia as well. I mean, like, yeah, women is a very That's like right. the majority of early childhood education teachers is, are women. Yeah, yeah, and but I think in this so in this instance there was a huge p- possibility because women teachers they understood what other families are going through, so they would be running those fantastic. Uh, podcasts and live streaming and recording so so news in new zealand we have this um every center runs a little bit differently but basically there is a there is a shared space for for families and and for teachers and children to uh, online where you have access to your child's uh, portfolio learning stories assessments uh, key learnings announcements and you would receive teachers basically performing classes. You would see mm-hmm. young three-year-olds having uh, Zoom catch-ups, you know, and Zoom play dates, yeah. you know, and um, they would be facilitated by teachers, you know. Teachers would what? just drop, right, let's just get together and do that. And I think it was absolutely amazing. It was real pedagogical innovation in a way they were thinking how to how to support the families and children and their learning. And part of it is, for me, is that, I'm always, when I see this pedagogy, I always think of curriculum because mm-hmm. I think we always need to come back to the curriculum framework and uh, curriculum framework for me talks about very clearly about importance of relationships mm-hmm. and that relationships are key. And I think that, and that's coming back to that argument at the beginning that I said about social and physical distancing. Yeah. We can keep physical distancing, but not social distancing. We need to value the relationships. We need to make sure that those relationships are fostered. I, We didn't mind how much knowledge sort of at the time is sort of translated, but keeping that those relationships and focus on the well-being, that was, that's what was important. And from my perspective, what I noted with... Um, couple of centers that visited since pandemic when the centers opened they carried these kind of new opportunities with them because in 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 new zealand in early child education we have a play-based curriculum that means children are learning through play so we don't teach children how to write or how to read we of course support them if they have an interest in knowledge and building but we don't do it but we have some centers that sort of decide and sometimes the parents really want want it so they are doing that but after the pandemic what i what i learned was they everybody sort of realized the importance of well-being and importance of relationship it sort of helped us to reflect on what we're doing it helped us to reflect also how we spend time and how we value the time being spent together it's an um I have to say that um, there's there's been key learnings from pandemics and we most likely will see next couple of years massive curriculum transformation and pedagogical innovation that it's that we're going to be able to pinpoint to the pandemic and the thinking that has happened there and the experiences what we had. I also often do wonder, and um, I'm doing now this paper on this, that... Um, it's a kind of uh, speculative thinking. What will happen with this generation of children? Mm. I mean, this generation of children, I mean, we all know that we are part of a particular generation which we experience something. You know, some people are generation of, uh, you know, internet. Some people generation of cell phones. Some people are generation yeah. of TV and VCR and yeah. da, 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 radio. Yeah. And what will happen with this generation that is sort of literally were thrown into uh, this kind of, Zoom virtual yeah. mode and the media uh, conference, the media social, right? Media yeah, social generation, yeah. maybe. Yeah, and 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 this generation in particular, maybe who were locked out of education for a substantial time, I think that there will be something specific that will connect them in the future as a generation, having sharing this experience. You know, everybody will remember and 
of those children and, and, and 15, 18 years, you know, when they will be young adults, um, what they were doing during the pandemic, you know, and, and how pandemic has influenced their, uh, um, their learning and their relationships. And, uh, and um, you know, it's, as I say, we, we're very lucky in New Zealand now, but I have a very dear colleague and collaborator in the United States, for example, and she's got a young boy. He's, uh, he's uh, three and a half years old. And for a very long, substantial amount of time, he wouldn't, he's a, he's a lone child. He wouldn't play with any other child. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, that's, that's really impact upon your ability to form key social relationships. And uh, yes, we can learn how to utilize Zoom and digital pedagogies and technologies, but it doesn't really replace those kind of uh, uh, key uh, ideas of a bodily relationship. Yeah. I mean, the idea of touch, the idea of making a mistake and falling down and having the laughter and that, all these things sort yeah. of can be in a certain way replicated, but but not not really. And as a teachers, as a pedagogical teachers, there is something about physical presence of a teacher. Mm -hmm. Physical presence of a teacher create a, for a child especially. If you think of child adult relationships in the classroom or in the early childhood center, children are children are small and it, and adults are tall. Yeah. And there is something that comes with that. That comes particular idea of relationship between that young child who is looking up to a dead adult and the adult when they want to have authentic relationship with the child they get down on their oh, level yeah. so they can see eye to eye mm -hmm. and there is something that simply you don't need to do on a zoom because it doesn't mean how tall you are you're staring at the camera and Bye. you just have that eye contact right yeah. so the, so there is that kind of equalizer but also what you cannot do as a teacher, what you do, you make a gesture. You turn around and you see something. Yeah. You make a wink. You make a playful comment or bodily movement. And it changes the interaction in the classroom. And the classroom erupts in the laughter. It's very difficult to do that over the Zoom. It's very yeah. difficult to maintain that level of engagement, that level of, of depth. And, and I think that that's what are some of the key, key learnings is that we can achieve something via these new pedagogies, but at the same time, we are very still restricted and we understand the importance of relationships, the importance of well-being, the importance of family, and the importance of really caring for each other and being together in the same space cannot be really replaced. Now, what the future will hold, we don't know. And that's something that we are really uh, concerned about because... Uh, um, as I said, what this generation will look like and how it will uh, be, that's, that, that's of a concern, you know, and that's, uh, um, that, that um, families are being separated around the world. Um, children are, uh, a lot of children don't go to schools and, um, you know, a lot, um, lot of lives were lost and disrupted and um, economic hardship fallen on families and um, you know, it's been uh, the uh, the training of teachers in some countries. I have reports from colleagues were disrupted. You know, practicums were disrupted, and uh, and so teachers don't learn the key skills in practice. And uh, these are very difficult um, difficult times. And uh, but I'm being very optimistic about the future. I think that uh, there is um, something, and that's where I want to come back to Simeo Chechev. Of course, Simeo Chechev needs to play a key role in a way that uh, it translates its practices. And I've been watching and admiring Simeo Chechev, how you embraced this kind of pandemic era with your webinars and sessions and outreach and making sure that you connect the people, that you speak with them, provide them with all the webinars and uh, information and uh, continue doing the work. And I think that's what, and, and I think that early childhood education sort of microcosm of what's happening in Simeo Chechev, you do understand you need to go and need to adjust some of the things and took those, took them as an opportunity 
that potentially reach out to those that normally you couldn't reach out. Um, allow people to participate that normally couldn't participate, for example, um, because they couldn't pay to come to particular capacity building workshop. But but accessing free webinars that are being recorded and posted, that's that's fantastic. And that's that's what really, really changes. And I think also more educational resources can be now found for children online than yeah. ever in the past. So that's another thing that has changed. And uh, But I also have to say it requires an expert advice which ones are useful and which ones are sort of waste of time and, um, you know, staring at a screen. Mm -hmm. Right. I think while I learned from you, I think there's a lot of things that we can like pinpoint, just like what is the mm. importance of the children's well-being in this mm. um, generations, like mm. how relationship between teachers as an adult and students as a young children is very important mm. that we cannot replace from the Zoom relationship like this. Um, mm. I think, mm. yeah, we will forward. Uh, and uh, as you said, that we have to optimize with this generations. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Professor Marek, I think uh, before we end our session today, I'd sure. like to ask you more general question or like broad sure. question, or maybe it's like more like suggestions. Um, it's about like how to improve access and quality in ACCE in Indonesia, and of course mm -hmm. in this Southeast Asia, as we are in re mm -hmm. re regional centers. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. what is the lesson learned from New Zealand? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question, and uh, um. I can't give you any advice. I'm going to say I'm really sorry. And the reason for that is because I, I don't feel comfortable giving anybody any advice. I do believe that each country and each region is so specific in a way yeah. that, they, that they deal with pandemic that what, what we can learn is when we look at holistically at what's happening in particular country. And that's what I try to portray about New Zealand, that the specific conditions, specific yeah. sort of government response that sort of trickled down to the early childhood center. So, so with specific narrative, but I, I, I would, but I, I'm going to suggest something that I thought that what, um, what works really well. And, and that is to, to really be kind to each other. I think that that idea of, of being kind and understanding and, um, and knowing that everybody is being affected by pandemic. By no means, not everyone is affected in the same way, but everybody is affected. And uh, during the time of crisis, people tend to think who is worse off. And I don't think that we can think like that. I think we need to consider that um, we are all worse off because, and um, and we need to really focus on our younger citizens, on children, and to really think, how they are experiencing this pandemic, how they are perceiving what's happening around them. And um, the second group that I think we need to really focus on are teachers, because uh, it's the teachers who need extra support because teachers are carrying dual, if not triple responsibilities in these times. And there is a lot that we're asking of them pre-COVID, and now we're asking even more of them to do this time and I think it's really important and what I what I learned as a lesson is to support them and to respect them in a certain way and to understand that the work that they're doing is really important really matters and I think that collaborative approach partnerships between families and teachers and researchers and and um simio chechep sort of people who worked it they are they are the key and really important to understand that no, it's not one size that fits all in this kind of time of crisis. We're all going through crisis. You may think that some family has it really easy and other not. Well, I don't think it's very true because we don't know what's happening, you know, behind the closed doors. We don't actually understand how difficult the situation is. So, so I guess what I would ask for uh, understanding kindness, tolerance, and thinking about how we can work together and collaborate. But I would also, for Indonesia and region, I would also take it as an opportunity, as you're doing now, to connect with the wide world, to listen and to learn, but also to tell us how you feel and how you're dealing with the situation. For us to learn from Indonesian experience, I, 
I have a um, colleague in, um, in, in Bandung whose father and husband passed away from COVID. And that's been extremely sad and devastating to me and, uh, and uh, to, to, to learn that. And it's just something that COVID doesn't choose, you know. I mean, it doesn't go after certain particular it's it affects all of us and um we need to be supportive of each other and understand and listen very carefully what are the needs of, of others so um that's i think what we could learn so there's one one thing that we could learn from new zealand is that when our prime minister started the uh, campaign during the pandemic she said we need to be kind to each other and i think that's that's a key message and and after that everything will go easier if we you know support each other mm. yeah i think that's a wonderful idea the world kind support understanding is mm. very important mm. in this era mm. because like mm. as a human right we we need each other to like facing this difficult time I think right that- right Right. And be understanding, listening to what people need, what building partnership and like work together. I think that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. So, uh, Professor, I think, and last but not least, do you have any messages or like wishes for Seamir Chechep? Yes, I do. I think I would just really wish Seamir Chechep not fourth birthday, but 40th birthday. I wish I wish you know, 36 more years of at least of uh, of this great uh, research teaching capacity work advocacy for children families and teachers it's an uh, when we when we started conceptualizing and working on senior church we we couldn't imagine how successful it will become and how it will be and how amazing people will grow within it and how they will carry the mission and uh, values of Simeo Chechep and and I think that even people who sort of questioned whether Simeo Chechep is important I think during the time of pandemic Simeo Chechep has proven and demonstrated its importance and I would argue that Simeo Chechep has been essential worker during the pandemic and has really done something amazing for teachers and, and families and, 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 and early childhood education specialists, not only in Indonesia, but in the whole Simia region. And I know that people outside of the region are watching what Simia Chechab is doing. So congratulations to all your achievements and at least 36 is more. Hmm. So thank you so much for your warm words, for your warm words, and also kind wishes for our centers. And I think that's wrap up our episode today, Professor Morek. We look forward to our next collaboration in the near future. I do Absolutely. really hope we can meet in a person. Like if the condition is getting better, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. It will be my pleasure and privilege. Yeah, thank you so much for your um, wonderful and insightful session today. And we really appreciate your precious time mm. with us mm. today. Mm. And Sahabat Chechep, so I do believe that you learned a lot from Professor Morak today. And okay, I think that is all for our today podcast. And thank you a lot for listening to us at Seomir Chechep Podcast. See you next episode and bye bye Kira